me and my wife, we wanted to weigh all options, uh, try to take the process as serious as possible because we look at it as a partnership between um, you know, whatever organization we were going to pick. Money wasn't, you know, necessarily the number one option for us. Obviously, it plays a part. I pictured myself in this uniform. She pictured um, living here and, and having family come and visit. We pictured playing with Bryce and, and Schwarber. It seemed like a lot of things added up. We were excited about it. This place is, is, is fun to play. Uh, I've watched a lot of the playoff games, and, and this place was rocking. So just a lot of things pointing this direction, and, and, and we felt really comfortable and really happy. And, um, we were really excited about it, so um, a lot of things said. Well, we have to give the owner credit. When you're spending $300 million, that's $300 million. But I guess Mr. Dombrowski, I'm going to ask him, made a phone call uh, to Mr. Middleton and said, John, this is what it's going to cost. What do you think? And Mr. Middleton said, you believe in a player? Dave said, absolutely. And then Mr. Middleton said, Dave, do what you have to do. Mr. Dombrowski says hello. Is that accurate? Did I relay that conversation properly, huh. Dave? Let's begin there. Go ahead. Yes, it is. It is accurate. I mean, it was one of those where um, you're negotiating, you're negotiating dollars that are, you know, are hard to believe, really, when you start talking about it. But it's understandable in today's world. And even in my situation, been doing this a long time, you only have so much authority. But when you come to that type of decision and need to make that decision, of course, you work very closely with your owner. And that's exactly what happened. Is that you believe in the player, then well, let's go ahead and sign him. Let's give it to him. Very good. Excellent job there. And uh, Mr. Middleton, you turned out to be accurate with Harper because he's won an MVP and won a pennant. So he felt confident. You are uh, very active and you go after it all the time at your MO. Did you know that there was another team in the mix? I mean, the Padres are sneaking up on everybody. Did you realize, whether it was San Diego or anybody else, did you know that you were up against stiff competition, Dave, in the Turner pursuit? How about that? Yes, we did. We did, actually. And there was another club, too, that was involved quite heavily. Um, so we were in a situation, we, we had knowledge in that regard, um, didn't know exactly what other offers were at that point, but we knew that they were aggressive and that they were large. We found out afterwards um, what we believed the numbers were. But um, yes, we did. And, and I, it was an unusual negotiation for me, and I, maybe in most unusual I've ever had in the sense that there were four for us really good shortstops, all quality individuals we met with all four of them we liked all of them but we are also in a spot where trey was the guy that was really number one on our list just for various reasons how we thought he fit in with the ball club and so going about and, and, and trying to accomplish signing him you're also gathering as much information as you possibly can not only about him but how the market stands and so we were in a position where we did have quite a bit of information people were helpful for us but by no means that we think that it was a lot that he was going to sign because uh, because of the choices that he had. He had some good choices. Uh, Dave, in that situation where, you know, there's some competition and some pressure, you know, you're doing it in hotel lobbies and all those things and suites in San Diego, do you have offers for the other four shortstops or as many as you wanted, you know, a couple shortstops? Do you have other offers on the table for them too? And the first one who says, I'll take it, you sign? Or do you have a pecking order where if Turner said no, you quickly pivot to shortstop number two? How does that work from your perspective? Let me hear. I'm interested. Well, great question. And I think it's dependent upon different organizations may do it in various ways. But for us, um, we were aggressive only in trying to sign him. Uh, we thought that uh, him being our number one choice would trade being our number one choice. We were in a spot that we wanted to be aggressive in first accomplishing that. And if we didn't, then we would have gone from there. But we did not make any other offers. We had a pulse of what we thought it would take with other individuals. Although to this day, I have no idea. And, and for example, Xander Bogarts, we met uh, with Bogey and think the world of him. And he ended up getting a great contract. Very happy for him. we got two other quality guys out there in Dansby Swanson and Carlos Correa, and, and I'm not sure what dollars they're going to get. But in our situation, we really focused on one because I didn't want to mislead anybody else at that point, and he was our, our guy. So we were hopeful that he would say yes, and if he didn't, then we would have pivoted and start trying to pursue the second person on our list. And what it comes down to, Dave, with this scenario, you, you basically you realize 11 years is, you know, that's a heck of a long time. Very few people this great that late in life as a baseball player. So 
you know, you get him and you give him the extra year and you hope you get six, seven great years out of him. And if you got to eat the other, not eat, but if you have to, you know, handle the other last three or four years in a contract, that's the price of doing business. So the years, you don't want to go 11, but you have no choice if you want to get the player. I'm assuming that's the case, correct? Yes, that's the case. You have to decide if you're willing to do that. And, uh, of course, production is going to be normally in these cases will be higher the younger the player is or until a certain number of years. Some guys last longer than others. But when you're projecting an elite player, I think they'll last longer than others as far as how high, how well they play. But I don't think we're necessarily projecting at 40 that he'll be doing the same thing as right now. So, yes, I mean, you have to be prepared that maybe you get more return on your investment if you look at it like that early in the player's career, and then at the end of the career, maybe not as much. But you, it's apparent if you're going to participate in trying to sign this type of talent in today's game, you're going to have to give a lengthy contract and probably one you wish you didn't have to give quite as long. But again, the price of doing business. There you go, Dave, and that's why you are going to the Hall of Fame. You, 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 you go after it and you make things happen. All right, how about the thing with Walker? Now, listen, gave him $76 million. He had a very, very good year at the Mets. Don't get me wrong. But that's a lot of money for a guy who really, he's got great potential, but over his course of his career, he hasn't been necessarily a $76 million pitcher. You take him away from the Mets, which you'd like. You needed another pitcher, which you like. You know, Turner is a little bit more of a sure thing. Walker is a little bit more of a fingers crossed scenario. Price of doing business again? Let me hear your take on that. Go ahead. Yeah, without, without getting too specific, because there's other things we have to do before individuals come in. They need to take physicals and all that. So I can't get too specific on this type of situation. But it's one where we looked at ours. We're, we're fortunate we have top of the rotation guys and Nolan Wheeler. We really like Suarez in that role. We have some real good young pitching coming. But we're in a spot where that next wave of individuals for us, that when you get away from the the top, top guys out there, the the, the Groms, the Verlanders, Rodons, then there's a group of individuals that we liked. Some came with qualifying offers, some did not. And for us, it was a situation that there's a differentiation between them and that next wave below them. And so for us, that would be the price of trying to sign an individual like this. Um, I know that somebody reportedly signed with uh, the Cubs. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not at this point. But when you start looking at the reported dollars and length of contract, again, I think that's what you're going to get into this market. That's what it was going to cost. And we talked about it. And I think if you would have sat at three years for any of these individuals, you wouldn't have signed them. And so there maybe there's a little bit more risk than, let's say, the others. But uh, we just thought that we liked the ability of this next group of guys. And we were going to be aggressive in trying to get somebody because we're trying to win. And we think we need that type of talent. And we also have some very good pitching teachers in our organization. Caleb Cotham, our major league pitching coach. Brian Kaplan, our assistant major league coach, uh, pitching coach. Uh, so those have worked with our starting pitchers, and we're in a situation. They're very good. They're very good in helping individuals, and um, we think that they're also beneficial and make, uh, can make guys better, too. Uh, Dave, let's discuss. We haven't had John, and you came on at the World Series. Dave walked up to the radio booth, World Series, before game one and gave me 15 minutes in a radio booth. Up, uh, This guy's a good man. But I have not talked to you since. Um, game six was stung, and you had a two games to one lead. And in game three, hitting home runs all over the park. And then Houston does their three uh, does their thing in their last three games. Uh, you know, Detroit with the Giants. You know, Giants were on a were on a buzzsaw. You know, obviously with the Red Sox, you did a wonderful job in eighteen. You would have loved to have gotten this one. Analyze the last three games for me against the Astros uh, last month. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Go ahead. Well, really tough. I mean, uh, a situation you're up two games to one. Of course, you're you're hoping that you win at that point. The uh, the one thing I will say that the Astros have a very good club. Sometimes you go into the postseason and you're in a spot where you get beat in a short series and you sort of shake your head and say, yeah, I think we had a better club than them. I think we could have won the series by all means. But it's not like we lost to a club that's, that's not doing their job. They're really good. Once we got to that two game to one lead, of course, we ran into a buzzsaw there in game four. I think a real important game was game five in our home ballpark. We had a chance to win that. Of course, lose it three to two um, or lose it. Yeah, we were in a three to two loss. We were in a spot where we had a chance. Uh, the catch in the ninth inning off Rio Multo, I think that goes down as one of the probably best catches in World Series history. Schwarber hits a ball in the eighth inning with two guys on that hits it right at Mancini. Mancini makes a heck of a catch. Um 
with driving two run, you're ahead four to three. And then if you go into Houston with a three game to two lead, it may be a, a different scenario. We've got Suarez sitting there in game seven, but wasn't meant to be. Uh, they played great. Uh, always tough to lose. Uh, much better feeling when you come out of the World Series winning it rather than losing it. But uh, we're in a position, I think our club played well, played great all year long. But hey, there's a, there's that hunger now to get back and, and try to win those two extra games in the World Series and uh, try to bring home the whole cha championship, the world championship here. And the last thing, Dave, everywhere you've been, you've been winning. You won in Boston. They've struggled since. You won in Detroit. We haven't heard from them in a long time. You, you had a lot to do with the Marlins and, and all, uh, when they won it, uh, when they beat, they beat my Giants, and, of course, they beat the Cubs and turned around and beat the Yankees. And now you're done in Philadelphia. I mean, that's basically you've had four runs at this. You know, listen, everybody gets fired. You were fired a couple times, too. It happens. But you've had four runs at this, and you've, uh, you know, you basically have done nothing but win in your career. Put a little cap on that for a sec. Let me hear well, I appreciate the comments. Um, I've been fortunate to be in situations here. At, early in my career is a little different, and I don't mean as far as winning is concerned, but a lot of building when you're with Montreal and starting an expansion franchise in Florida, you're building from the very beginning. But later in my career, um, going on to Detroit as we built that, and then Boston, and then here in Philadelphia, we've been in a position where we've been aggressive, trying to win tremendous people in the organization. It's always about the organization, the people that you have around you. Ownership's been great. And then I think the other part that people say, well, what's the common thread of all that? It's having a lot of tremendous players. And we've had some really good players and been fortunate to have that. So I you know, hope to keep doing this in Philadelphia and hope to keep winning here. And uh, we have a lot of good players, a good ownership and a good organization. So I feel very um, right about the future here. Why not, Dave? Great job. Happy holidays. I know Trey Turner's going to have a nice holiday. I can guarantee you that. Happy holidays for the Dabrowski family. Appreciate you coming on, as usual.